Well, hello, and welcome to the Advanced Prop Building Panel by Wolfgar Weapons and Props. That's us. That's I'm Ooh. James Wolfgar. This is Seth Wolfgar. No, I mean Seth Knight. Um, yeah, I, I, that yeah, was that a was really bad joke. We're, you're going to see a lot of really bad jokes throughout this panel, but that's really... Just us. That you're just going to have to <laughs> deal with it, I guess, but um, I hope you like them. But we're, we're, I'm a dad, so I get to make those jokes. So this, I'll inter let him introduce himself. Hi, I am Seth Knight. I've been working with James for a few years, building props of all different types. And over to our left is... John Quaid. Who? John Quaid. <laughs> yeah, you can find him under Who John Quaid. That's his, like, his tag. Mm -hmm. Where can we find you, Seth? Instagram. No, but like, under what? Uh, Seth Knight. Seth that's, Knight that's with a really K. Original. Yeah. Really, yeah, really like, really a, like a knight in shining armor. All right, so, yeah, it's or, or like, really weathered, really cool-looking prop armor, <laughs> right? Like a knight in really cool prop armor. Hopefully, preferably. Yeah, the right? polished armor doesn't really... Let's sense. get going before it becomes night in here. Oh, oh man. No. It's the wrong night, though. All right, so let's <laughs> really... <laughs> let's just jump into this, because we're just going to make so many bad jokes. That's who we are, and why are we doing this, right? So, like, a lot of this, why we're doing this is we want to share the knowledge that we've accru accumulated, um... Over the past, I mean, I've been doing this for over 10 years now. Um, professionally, I've been doing it for like seven. And we, do, we know a decent amount of things about prop making. And we'd like to share some of the advanced tips and tricks. And then just kind of do a deeper dive into the things we know. Um, we, do, we have a couple panels that we've done at conventions. And we also are going to put on online as well that are about just prop making. Um, they'd be like more of the basics. Uh, this one is is advanced. So if we don't cover something, you're like, why didn't they say that thing? It might be that we just already covered it once before. So there should be a link around here somewhere, maybe for the uh, for the other one. So hopefully, if you're watching this, you can watch and the other one. Also, if you have any specific questions that were not answered in this, please feel free to comment. We will be making at least a few more videos answering specific questions asked in the comments through YouTube, maybe even Twitch, and wherever this is posted. Um, but feel free to ask. We would love to answer questions as best we can. Yeah, and, and bringing up Twitch, we kind of used our Twitch as a office hours, uh, like live thing. So this is this is a pre-recorded panel. But on our Twitch, you'll always find or mostly find Seth and Quaid and me sometimes um, on our Twitch. And we are just sitting there kind of building things. But we use that as like people can pop in. They can see what we're working on. They can see if, they, if they've ordered something from us how we're doing on that sometimes um and then also just kind of ask live questions so if you have if you want to talk to us live uh, there's that and we do other uh, other panels as well but um yeah so going a little deeper dive into uh the advanced prop making um we covered before we covered like safety and a few other things but just a reminder doesn't matter how advanced you are or how cool you think you are uh, be safe about what you're doing. So use safety equipment. We, we covered that in the other stuff. But remember that it's about how you, like, you need to actually be safe. It doesn't matter if you have all the safety gear on, but you're doing something stupid, then you're still going to possibly hurt yourself. So please watch out for that. Um, and the more advanced tools, the more advanced the, the safety you need to have. Um, and we're going to cover stuff like some materials, um, some different ways of fabricating things, uh, a lot of just, like, little tips and tricks that we use around the shop ourselves um we all kind of are do things in a different way and we also do things um you know we have our specializations i guess so it might be something that he knows about that i don't um but yeah with that said we're gonna we'll just jump straight into some materials okay and i mean what's 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 awesome about this is we're, we're really we, i want to do it as a panel Right, like we we're literally doing a panel, so I mean, obviously you guys disagree with me all the time on certain things, but feel free to like, you know, bounce back and forth, mm -hmm. leave comments mm -hmm. if you're watching this. So, but our first material up that we're going to cover today is um, like advanced stuff with EVA foam. So, who wants to go first? I mean, I'm always going to give it to Quaid first, but I can jump in. I can, I can handle this. Go for it. Okay. <clears throat> so, one of the best things about EVA is its versatility. You have different types of EVA foam from densities to thicknesses to like all kinds of lengths and uh, widths. Um, usually it comes in a roll, but you can literally just get it in just huge panels too. 
Um, it's really, really good for mostly costume stuff, but also you can build up quite a few different props out of it, especially like swords and other things like that. Um, it's best used, in my opinion, for larger things. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, like larger things like shields or like large, like very large swords, like uh, you in anything Monster Hunter, and you're probably going to see somebody build with EVA foam. Um, I don't really care for its use in like smaller stuff because it's uh, it tends to get spongy at times. Like it's, it's a little harder to work with unless you get like a lot of the higher density stuff, and then maybe. Um, but it, you can do all kinds of different effects on the texturing and all kinds of stuff like that. You can make it look like wood grain. You can make it look like leather. You can make it look like metal. You can like do all kinds of stuff. It's a really highly versatile material, and it's also been in use for a while. Like. Mm -hmm. There's literally parts of the uh, costumes from the fifth element that are made out of e just EVA foam with like fabric over them. So even if you're not using it as a finished thing, you can just coat it in something else and achieve all kinds of stuff with it. You want to go next or I got stuff? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah, so there's there's a ton of different advantages to using EVA foam. Like first and foremost, it's lightweight, right? So uh, I love the fact that it's also waterproof too. Um, so you can sweat in it and go outside and, and like, if, especially if you've coated it, if you've, um, when you're building with the EVA, it, this is not super advanced, but, um, you do want to like make sure to go over it with a heat source, either a heat gun or a, um, a flame. And you want to like basically, uh, close all the cells even more. It's a closed cell foam, but you close it all even more. And, and once you do that, you put paint on it, usually flexible paint. Um, and you know, you can cut up, cover it with creature cast or you can cover it with plastic dip, um, and then put your paint on it. It's really, really flexible. And the other cool thing about foam is when it does like get crinkled up and sh start showing a lot of like cracks and wear and tear, a lot of times you can just go over it, even with the, with the paints and go over it with a heat gun and it will smooth out, um, which is super cool. It's also very flexible as far as like the, if you have a moving part that you need to flex a little bit, like on your, on your wrist. It will give you a little bit of flexibility. It's also soft. Um, there's You can score it and detail it super well. I'm, we're not going to go crazy into it other than I personally think that it's the best material I've ever used to really go crazy with weathering and super high detail work. Like You can use thermal plastics, which we'll talk about. You can use lots of other different things. Um, I also really like it on my laser cutter. Um, it it gets me, I can, I, with foam, and specifically EVA foam, I can actually cut the, cut it and engrave it, and when I'm engraving, I can do it at a very fast speed and a decently high power and actually get a really, really great engraving on it at a very fast, like, time, where if I'm using wood or acrylic or ABS or something like that, it just takes longer, and again, it's durable, you can cover it, um, there's just so many good things about it. It's and it's it's lightweight and you can make it look like really anything like you said leather metal all sorts of different things and the other thing I want to bring up before I pass the mic is with materials I'm not all about one material like you can definitely use EVA foam to cover and skin things you can skin you can, by skinning what I mean is actually you can take like thin layers of foam and put them over top of things right so. Um, either other pieces of foam or uh, like whatever else and you basically can you, you put it over it and you cover your seams you can do a lot of different things like that um, but in general you can use ABS plastic along with foam along with PVC along with metal along with a bunch of different materials so we're not trying to say hey you should just use one this is just down the line we're going down EVA you got anything else to add on EVA hmm. yeah because we're just talking about foam right now yeah. just foam. Um, so he mentioned you can do some different scoring and different things to do different techniques to have different looks or weathering. So even we talked about how it can be make it look like leather. So a lot of times when you score or hit it with a knife or whatever, if you hit it with a, a heat gun after, it'll expand those lines a lot better so they're way more detailed than the thin little slice you might get with like a normal knife. When you hit it with a heat gun, it'll expand it a little bit. So like, for instance, if it's a piece of wood, pieces of wood have lots of different size lines so you can do little cutouts and things and expand them as much as you want to as well mm -hmm. by like heating different foam um also when you heat foam and you form it in a way and then it cools down it'll really keep that shape a lot of times so that's also 
semi-advanced technique, but also something just like a normal thing that lots of people do with foam. Um, but there's lots of just different techniques you, you can do with foam. But also, it doesn't always have to be the outside and the detailed part. It can, like he said, be used in other parts. We use it sometimes for padding for helmets, mm -hmm. um, inside of like shins and other pieces that you make out of other materials. Um, it makes great for, because it's very soft and durable. Like people even put them when they make fake shoes on the bottom of shoes because it has lots of cushion and things like that and their feet aren't hurting by the end of the day. Um, so it has many great uses. We even use it sometimes for insulation when we have a bunch of extra, yeah. over it, right? Like, so yeah. you, you, it, it has great uses in a shop. Um, yeah. for all different and, ways so, and, yeah. uh, and to kind of segue into more materials it also bonds very well with a lot of other materials mm -hmm. as well um warbla is a thermoplastic that's very well like uh, very versatile and very like easy to work with and it's mostly used to detail over a foam shape to start with um so instead of having to use a bunch of warbla you can make the foam shape in like whatever piece that you're making and then you just coat that in warbler and you can add the small details onto it. So it even works as a good base, not necessarily just the finish of it. Also, there's um, products like foam clay and stuff like that, which is a basically a close relative in composition to Here, it. If you want to show some, yeah, I so grab some from back there. This is from uh, SKS Films. Yeah. SKS Props and yeah, HD, HD Foam. foam and this one opens? This one's open. Yeah, it's really open. So, it's always so weird and like it's wet because huh. it's not dehydrated. But um, basically, this will set up to the, about the same consistency as uh, EVA foam. And even like as I'm working with it now, it still already has like that gray, like kind of porous texture. But you can literally squish it into any shape. So, Instead of having to like Dremel or like cut into or carve the details that you want, you can actually just coat or form the shape that you're after with foam clay and then like sand that down into the exact shape that you want. So, and it bonds really, really well to EVA foam. Um, and, or you can coat it, the coat, the foam clay and warble afterwards too and create the shape that way. Mm -hmm. You want to um, tell them about putting uh, amateur wire in it? Oh yeah, absolutely. So a lot of um, f uh, costume parts or prop parts um, are kind of just like strangely designed. So like maybe it's like a spike or something, right? Or an antenna or something. Or an antenna. <clears throat> well, instead of uh, like using like a, like, a, like a traditional clay that like is going to be heavy and brittle, you can use armature wire um, wrapped in foam clay and it's super lightweight. Um, it's fairly like strong, like it's not going to like crack and like break apart and it's not gonna add a lot of weight to your prop or your costume. So you can also, to a, to a degree, um, move the armature wire after the foam clay is set up into it to position it differently. So like, oh, maybe you thought you had the right shape, but maybe you were just a little bit off or maybe from a certain direction it just doesn't look quite right. You can still move it just a bit and like achieve the goal that you're looking for there. So not only is uh, EVA foam one of the most versatile materials in itself on its own, but it's also one of the best materials to work in conjunction with most of the other commonly used um, materials used for prop making and cosplay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was going to be a, that's a good point too. So a lot of the adhesives that we're going to talk about later definitely work really well with EVA. Um, and like even the stuff that works with like rubber, and like latex that does not always stick to the other things, it works, that stuff also sticks to foam. So, and when we say foam, we are talking about specifically like EVA foam. Uh, some people might see it as like, like floor mat foam, but they actually make very um, specific like costume EVA foam yeah, costume that you can, that you can buy from uh, multiple different vendors. Um, yeah, so that's, that's a lot about EVA foam. There's definitely more um, I'd say a couple of my really like favorite tricks that I want to talk into since this is advanced. Um, I, I really like building with foam because you can weather it as much or as little as you want. And like he was saying, you can literally hit it with a heat gun afterward or a flame. Like an actual, I like using a torch on it. Um, and I've actually used like a torch to just literally burn through it. Now wear a respirator again. 
wear a respirator or do it outside in, ventil in a highly ventilated area. Um, but you can take like a torch and literally burn through. I have some pieces of armor that I've made that I just took fire and burnt through the foam and it looks awesome because it just, it, it's you can see burnt. that it's melted and it burnt and it looks and you can paint it to make it look like it was like steel and it looks awesome, right? And yeah. that's, that's a really cool thing about it. Now you can do that with some Ooh. thermal plastics that might like bend out of place, right? And not really look as great. Uh, so again, there's, it's so versatile it's lightweight. It's really what a lot of people. Uh, it's also affordable. So like there are definitely high end, um, like latexes and other things like that you can make, that in in Warbla and other places that you can see a lot of like high end movie costumes made out of. Now movie costumes are moving more toward like the EVA type foam, but as far as like what you get out of it, what you can do with it, everything, it's it's literally one of my favorites for sure. Okay. Um. Anybody else have anything to add maybe about maybe the sizes of it? Oh yeah, and also that's yeah. that's a really good idea. Sorry, um, Craig brings up a great point that you can buy it in all sorts of different layer thicknesses. So uh, it comes in rolls. Um, definitely when you when you, when you bring it out of the roll, make sure to lay it out flat. Like it literally says on the instructions, take it out of this roll and lay it out flat and let it sit for a while. You can also hit it with a heat gun or a very light heat source. Um, Actually, I use, if you can see it behind me, I use this um, heater. Space it's a space heater. It's a, it's a thermal space heater. And I literally will just take a piece of foam and kind of hold it up close to that. It doesn't hurt my hand. And I can just hold it. Um, and then it'll, it'll make it malleable. It. It'll do everything you need to do as far as making it hot, hotter. It's great. So, yeah. So, the thing is, when it comes out oh. of a foam roll... There, we, there's a lot of things yeah. we're going we're like, to keep thinking we could, more things like, right? we could literally spend probably like hours and hours and hours and hours yeah. about it um, but to few, his point real quick yeah. um, it does come in like everywhere from one millimeter all the way up to like two inches right and what's great about that is if you're cutting through it and it's super easy to cut and that sort of thing but when you're cutting through it you can you know really get high detail because you're using a three millimeter piece here and a one millimeter piece here and a six millimeter piece here and that sort of thing um, there are also tons and tons of resources out there that plenty of people made. They usually call them foam smith or foam smithing. If you look up, there's books uh, that people, that tons of people have, have written. Very, very highly skilled people have done, and I'm sure you have more to talk on it. Um, just, just to kind of like wrap up, just the EVA foam. We have a few more materials yeah, that we want to work with too. Um, there's also multiple ways of like cutting and shaping it too like we talked about a little bit in our basic pro, uh, prop building thing like we all use different types of tools like james uses like the laser cutter primarily when working with foam and if he does work if he or he'll use shears like quaid usually uses scissors other things like that right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i'll use typically use a box uh, a box knife um and that's just all personal preference but there's multiple ways you can use like uh, you can tool it so some people even use band saws or scroll saws mm -hmm. on it so because it gives them a very like high amount of control and a, a fairly clean cut so there's multiple ways you can work with the material too as well as the versatility with it it might be kind of daunting but because it's like just a roll of like foam and then you have like people are making like monster hunter armor out of it but there's a lot of tutorials it's a lot of things that you can just take it slow find what works for you and hopefully you can get into it because it's a lot of fun uh, moving on, we said uh, we are going. Are we going to go into the three D printing fulfillment, or are sure. we going to go into you know? Yeah, right. let's do three D printing. All right, three D printing. So there's a lot of different types of filaments. There's a lot of very specific use types of filaments. Um, we're primarily uh, talking about FDM types. There's also resin, uh, which is a great resource if you can get in, if you can get into that as well. Um, that one requires a little bit more safety to work with. Um, the top three are for FDM are PLA, PETG, and ABS. Um, we primarily do PLA, but PETG is one I think we'll be doing more of soon. Um, ABS requires a little bit more safety and um, finishing um, differences, but ABS is great for if you are making a mass a specific like one-time use master for something that you'll be doing for a casting. It stands really great. Um, PLA is really good for general all-purpose printing, either if it's in a prop or if it's for, like, I don't a know, phone any holder. Type of fabric, any type of fabrication, yeah. literally any kind. Um, PTG is just kind of the um, more, literally more advanced version of uh, PLA, 
um, has a higher heat tolerance, but also requires you to print it at higher uh, uh, temperatures. And I mean, you can make all kinds of stuff like from either like one small part or I mean, as John's making literally like three foot tall <laughs> creations. Yes. Yeah, like that's that's a really good point. There's a lot to all the different materials that you can print with. But you want to talk about some of your favorites or how, kind of how to work with them? Um. Yeah, sure. I primarily just use PLA on my own projects um, because I have a few smaller printers. I have some Ender 3 printers that have smaller beds. Um, but you can print anything from something very tiny as long as you make your layer heights with it and still have some pretty good detail with some PLA. Um, even better if you do in resin, but you get some very tiny things that with really good details, or you can enlarge things and make them very big, which is currently what I'm doing. Lots of different like helmets, and I'm making a whole costume out of it. So a giant head of a character. Um, <laughs> it's I'm a making big head, like so. All it comes down to is like slicing it up in your slicers and getting the files the right way and printing them different parts and then assembling them together. Um, and yeah, so, so how do you, um, when working with that, with like PLA or PTG, how do you mm -hmm. join your parts together the best? Um, if we're going to go into it. Yeah. A little bit, but. Yeah. So currently right now I'm just using the super glue we're using or the Bob Smith well. industries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's just how I've been doing it. And then you'll have kind of big seam lines because obviously you're putting different pieces together. And there's all sorts of techniques I'm doing, I've been doing, a but sculpt. so like, I think he's got some back there. Yeah, I got some just in case we talked about mm -hmm. it. Yeah, we, we should. Um, so they have an A and B part epoxy sculpt, um, which comes out kind of looking like what he has. So if you want to look here, it has an A and B part. The nice part about like this set, we've had other sets. Um, it has a white and a gray, and by that, once you completely mix it together. Um, it'll be all white, so you know you've mixed it, but you do um, same amount of both um, and mix it together, and then it becomes almost like a Play-Doh, I guess you could say. Um, and you can get a little bit more wet if you want it more wet and like to smooth over areas, but I fill all my gaps a lot of times with that, and then over 24 hours, it'll harden completely mm -hmm. um, into like epoxy does, but it takes about 24 hours. Um, and then I go through different sanding techniques and scraping techniques and stuff to get rid of it And it almost completely covers that line if I have any other like smaller lines after that because I really gap filled it um, I use like different like types of bondo Bondos that are like a more of a paste to and fill some of the gaps with that because it doesn't fill as much or harden as much but it's nice and sandable and mm -hmm. i can work with that so yeah right which brings us right back to the this these are all 3d printing um mm -hmm. materials yeah resin we talked about a little bit we i want to go into it there's two things i want to talk about with these materials um first durability of the materials is you know a lot of it depends on the actual material but a lot of it also depends on if it's a 3d printed part what your like infill is and that sort of thing and your actual structure of your model. So somebody might say, well, I tried a PVC, no, I tried an ABS piece and it was brittle. I'm like, no, ABS is not brittle very much. It might be just the way it was printed. Um, and also they can all be heat formed because it's, these are all thermal plastics that are coming out of, a, of a, a printer. And also resin printing, you can do all sorts of different types of resin. Um, some that are very, very like durable um, they're usually more expensive, but they all, also resin can be heat formed and like moved around once once completed. Um, there's all sorts of different kinds of resins coming out for three D printing. Um, some of the the really exciting things I'm I would just started to use in the shop. Um, usually we have to use a resin printer and we have to um, put it in a wash and cure station. What that means is you have to actually cure it with UV light after it's done. Um, and wash it first with like alcohol or, or denatured alcohol and then um, then you have to actually hit it with a wash right well there's now water soluble um, or water washable not soluble sorry uh, that basically is resin that comes out it's just the same way as the other resin but you it comes out and you don't have to cure it or don't have to cure it as much or if you cure it like a little bit it'll make it that much uh, mm, excuse me more durable so there's a lot to those printing techniques. I mean, there's a ton of different things on PLA, uh, PETG, and ABS. The other thing I want to talk about 
as well as far as when we're talking about materials is like PETG doesn't just come out of a printer. It also comes in sheets, same with ABS, and those are fantastic to work with. Uh, PETG, like clear PETG, a lot of like face shields, the clear that you're looking through, is a PETG sheet. So as far as prop making wise, there's all kinds of stuff you can do that. You can cut it with scissors, you can cut it with a laser cutter, you can cut it with all kinds of different things. Uh, laser cutter, you wanna make sure it's vented pretty well. Um, but in general, thermoplastics, we, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more after this, but that's what all the 3D printing, all these plastics are. They're just thermoplastic, just in a different form. So if somebody's saying that they can use ABS sheets in a certain way or PVC in a certain way, well, you can also use it in the same way out of a 3D printer, right? They're the same actual material. There's definitely some differences in, like I said, how, how things are printed. Um, yeah, there's probably tons more here. Um biggest thing to say about the like the cap 3d printing unless john has mm. any more um is just like 3d printing mo like most all of it is like say for printing there might be some like stuff like where abs you need to make sure that it's a ventilated area um but whenever you're working with plastics be sure that you know like how hazardous they are make sure that you have the right safety equipment for them um, like PVC is one that's kind of nasty, but it's really useful. Um, Sintra, which is the extruded, like plate it's the, form. Yeah, it's a flat um, form. PVC. Yeah, it's like the panel form of PVC is extremely useful and versatile, and it's primarily what if you've seen like a Mandalorian costume, it's made almost entirely out of that, um, and it's extremely durable, so it's great for like backing or like reinforcing a piece and stuff like that. Uh, most three D print filaments are pretty good to go or there's um, warnings on them like these need to be well, more well ventilated or things like that um, moving on to thermoplastics in general because that's kind of the yeah, same point yeah. really useful thermoplastics are like some of the best materials they usually come a little higher cost by mm, name some of them like uh, Warbler and Hot Glue like Warbler is the most well known and at least in the cosplay community um it started out as a uh, plastic that was used for shoe production. Once again, shoes and props are kind of somehow getting really tied up in things. Um, really good material. It's a little more costly, but the results are really good, especially um, if you uh, can f like sand and finish and seal it really, really well. Um, ABS, really useful. One of the best like materials as far as like uh, panels go for like reinforcing things or even just making things. Or laser cutting um, things. Especially laser cutting things. Sintra, don't laser cut that. That's PVC. Um, be very careful if you're laser cutting any plastics. Make sure that it's actually not going to just like create a chlorine bomb or anything like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Warbler, you can laser cut. Um, typically just for the cutting out of, not yeah, necessarily yeah. the engraving of. Um, and there's tons of different kinds of Warbler. Exactly. And thermoplastics too. Yeah. Hot glue is technically a thermoplastic. So um, there are all kinds of. Is there any more thermoplastics you can think of? Because um, I don't work with Yeah, there's a ton of different th thermoplastics. And it sounds like, so for hot glue, for example, it's everybody's used it to glue things together, but you can also put hot glue in silicone molds. So like, put mold release in there or baby powder, and you can put hot glue in there, and then you have a flexible, like, actual cast. And that's just thermoplastics. Um, the, you can fill, there's a lot of people who fill, we, we've done it before, we fill, like, holes in props or gaps with, with thermoplastics um they make wood filler right there's some wood filler that you can heat up in a heat gun and like in a, in a hot glue gun but it's wood filler and that's also thermoplastic that works great for like filling in knots of trees and random things like so definitely there's so much information out there on the internet about thermoplastics in general but what we wanted to cover is like the ways we use them and i'd say a, a giant way that we use thermoplastics as far as like in the sheet form is either what, with laser cutting so they're great to like be a plastic that we can make look like all kinds of different things on a laser cutter. We can engrave it, we can cut it. And then also for backing too, because because it's thermoplastics or actually, or fronting, I guess is what you want to call it, or for skinning. Um, because it's thermoplastic, it, you can be, it can be bent with heat. Um, so a lot of times what we'll do is we'll throw it on the back of some foam or on the front of some foam and really detailed that way. And that like, that's, you see people do that with warble all the time. Um, yeah, so that's that's a lot of what I have on thermoplastics, but there probably is tons more that I'm forgetting as well. There's just tons. Um, 
You got anything else on that? Oh, not on that. All right. Well, so moving on to like metal. Okay. So, I mean, we will come back to acrylic because that was above me, above there on my list. But um, so metal is. I mean, you can't talk about making props without talking about using metal, specifically for like using screws and things that really, really need to be um, held together well. You can use metal hinges, and you can actually also uh, weld things together. There's aluminum and copper sheets and aluminum um, like pipes. I have a bunch of pipes right above me. So metal is one of those things that I feel like a lot of people get into prop making or costume making and they're kind of afraid of right they'll say like oh man that like metal seems like it's gonna be really heavy or it's gonna possibly like cut me or i don't have the right tools to go through it there's a lot of different ways you can use it just with like snips and um just you, you have you can get a grinder you can use a, a dremel tool on it or a, a rotary cutter um there's all sorts of ways of using metal to your advantage um Instead of using a PVC pipe, like I talked about in another video, you can use an um, aluminum pipe that actually has the same fittings. Now you can use the same fittings, like a, a PVC of fittings, and then just use the aluminum pipe. So if you're making like a seven foot long spear, it's going to droop if you use PVC. If you use wood, maybe, maybe not. Probably but, very heavy. But yeah, wood might be pretty heavy, but an aluminum pipe is going to be durable. It's going to be lightweight. It's not going to droop at all. You can, you know, put a screw through it pretty easily. Um, you can do like, you know, pinning screws and all kinds of different things. So there, there's a lot of different things we can do with metal. Um, what are some of the, do you have any like specific, uh, like deeper dives, tips and tricks on using metal? I have some, but go, you haven't talked in a while, so <laughs> I'm just <laughs> no, talking about you. I'm sorry. Nothing on top of mine that yeah. I have. Okay. Nothing I'm ready with. Um, yeah. with, with metal, um, once again, don't be scared of it. Be very careful with it because it does create like sharp burrs and things like that. As long as you are like have a file set or like um, essentially anything that can like sand it down or like smooth it safely, it's not super difficult to use. Um, it does take, I think, stronger tools than most like bolt cutters for like um, stuff. Also, like threaded rods are really extremely useful. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked to before about uh, making props break down and stuff like that. This is where like Part of using metal over other materials really comes in because it's much stronger than like say like like warbla is like even if warbla is really good it's not it's not metal um copper and like brass piping and stuff like that really useful like you said um but you can actually get a lot of like hardware from like mastercar or other places like that and you can actually like real part out things so instead of being like well i i want to like i have to like make a bunch of like like screws or whatever if the if it's not like hindering the weight too much you can just use like wide like uh, wide headed bolts that don't have much of like a like a like a threaded part and just put those into all of your costumes you don't have to like create a faux quality in that um so there's a lot of options and a lot of cool things and you don't always have to like recreate something in a, in a faux fashion you can just use bolts and screws and stuff yeah. yeah, yeah, I and just like attaching different props and different pieces together a lot of times there's just like metal plates that already have pre made holes in them so you can like drill and attach one thing to another and have a strong bond even in ways like that. Um, but the thing I kind of want to speak about metal is kind of a safety issue. So there's lots of different ways to cut metal, but when you're using different types of blades and things like that, really making sure that they're actually made to cut the metal so you don't hurt yourself or the tool, things like that. I know he said we can use bolt cutters. Those are good for metal. Um, but there's different saws and different things that have different, like even ways the teeth are made on the different saws different. to actually cut metal. Um, in our earlier, or in our other panel, we talked about how to cut actual like PVC pipe, but there's metal PVC pipe cutters as well um, mm -hmm. that'll cut through metal. I think we have like a Husky one over there where yeah. it's almost like a turn one that'll slowly grind in and cut, sorry, um, metal in a way that like is actually safe for and is not gonna ruin your actual tool. So, um, but make sure that your actual PVC cutter can cut metal because some of them can't, some of them can. So um, really be making sure when you're like 
doing stuff with metal that you're using the right stuff even drill bits oh, like for sure. there's certain drill bits that can't go through metal and there's certain that can so really make sure that you're like reading the labels and checking everything that you're actually using that it's you're using on the right type of material as well so yeah, yeah and when you're when you're using it it's going to be like if you want to pop a hole through metal you have to go slow and press hard and use a drill press hopefully and use actual um you know, lubrication on it, right? They make that, they make, if it's a chop saw, there are chop saw blades that cut through metal. Look into it. There's there's tons of information out there, but don't be scared of it. And, and I do want us to mention that we are going through all the materials right now, but we're definitely going to go into more like actually how to make things move and how to make things light up and durability and things like that. And that's part, durability is a big part of the metal, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you want something to be super durable, like I was talking about with the spear, with the metal inside, that's a big part of it. So We'll, we'll keep going through the through the materials, but we constantly are using some type of bits of metal in some way or shape or form. Um, so the next thing, the next piece of uh, material I want to cover is acrylic. Um, so acrylic's a lot like a thermoplastic, and it might even be classified as a thermoplastic. I believe it is to a point. I'm just, I just classify it as a different thing. Um, acrylics are really, really cool because they carry light very, very well. So we'll talk about that when we go into making light, light up props, that sort of thing. Um, it's there. There are things that are acrylic cutters. Um, so what it'll do is it'll let you, it'll score some acrylic for it if it's in a sheet, and then you can like you know break it. You can also just use a box cutter, score it a few times with a sharp with a straight edge, and then literally you can break it over your knee or the side of the table. Make sure you're wearing safety stuff on it. But that's. Literally, that's to me when I'm using the acrylic. I think a thing that a lot of people try to do is they try to cut it with a saw or they try to cut it with other things and it'll either crack or break. But if you can score it and then literally break it, a lot of times that's very helpful. You can also use a laser cutter, which I use a lot. But there's what, what do you have on an acrylic? Um, if it's kind of going back, following John's thing about like the right tool for the job, there are saws that can cut uh, ac acrylic. Okay. Um, but they need to be specific, like tooth, count, uh, yeah, like tooth count and stuff like that. Um, most hand saws are really not like, unless it's like a fine jeweler saw, probably you should have different options for that. Um, having like finding a maker space that has a laser cutter is probably your best bet for use of acrylic, unless it's like panels, which you can just snap break, which you should definitely try to use a edge of a table for. Do not try to, unless it's like a, a wide break. Don't, you can also clamp it down and then um, snap it as well if it's a small enough piece and you want a really clean break. Um, but, yeah. Yeah. But right tool, right tool for the job. Yeah. Do as I say, don't, don't not as I knee. do. Yeah, don't so hurt your knees. I do like to break Wait, As you're getting, you're getting mind. older, you need those knees. You probably shouldn't break things over Oh, them. just replace them with metal knees like we just talked about. Durable knees. That's, that's what doctors do, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what else, What do you got on acrylic? Mm, I don't know. Stuff and things. As in, like, like if you need to, a lot of it is used when you want to do like very clear stuff to see mm -hmm. through things that isn't really like if it's flat things that are clear, right? Yeah. Like, and it comes. It, it comes like, in yeah. different colors. It comes in all sorts of things, yeah. but like a lot of acrylic, we use a lot of time. Like you said, it takes light well and things like that. But even if we want like clear stuff, we use acrylic a lot too. So. Yeah. So uh, I'll do like Daglo blades and everything that are actually just like yeah fluorescent or transparent um, acrylic that I'll cut mm -hmm. out and we'll cut or out like a ways, cover yeah. for like something or yeah like, to make to change or light. that or the lens on the. Mm -hmm. Star Fox helmet or whatever that you use. So we right? do, yeah, we would be remiss if we didn't cover acrylic because we use it a lot. Mm -hmm. um, it is very brittle, though. Like, you can actually break it. It's not something I would say, hey, a great way of, of building is just straight up out of acrylic. That would be probably not a good idea. Um, we have used, like, mirrored acrylic to make some costume pieces mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. and some other pieces, too. Um, you can bend it a little bit. You, yeah, you can right. definitely heat form it, again. So you can bend it, but mirrored acrylic is really fun because it looks like a mirror. And you can have like like your chest armor and everything yeah. else. Can I made a whole like a armor suit. set out of a mirror, uh, yeah, acrylic, yeah. Yeah, so it's pretty cool. Yeah, his Kylo Ren was like. The but armor but we laser cutted Ren. all the holes to fit rivets that I riveted onto a costume because to figure out how to actually put acrylic on a costume is kind of hard, and to drill holes in it, you can't like just drill a straight hole, and then you have to go very slow, mm -hmm. or you have to use like 
like like a slow moving like drill yeah. almost or laser cut it so we just la- pre laser cut the holes which helped to not crack it where you have cracking in corners and things so mm-hmm. yeah yeah and it, the other last thing I want to say about it is just like most of the stuff on here it really works well with CA glue right mm-hmm. and with contact cement and some other things so like one of the reasons we like Bob Smith Maxi Cure Super Glue one is or CA glue is one the fact that it literally takes almost every one of these materials we're talking about and puts them together with like no problem um or at least sets them so we can put a screw in there or put like some type of ties around it or something but that the acrylic i love working with glues and acrylics because they go right together right away but you only do get one shot um going to more a couple more materials and we're done uh wood uh obviously like wood is a so big useful. thing to do uh, props out of right so yeah. so I mean I could talk on that too but you want to go no, sure um, using wood is a very useful material um, some people make entire props out of it there's uh, like a guy who literally will make all of his blasters out of uh, like machined and laid uh, wood it's woodchuck yeah woodchuck I, I didn't know if we were name dropping oh, sorry. woodchuck I go like check out his like work he's amazing yeah. okay sorry that was a little bit much um, <laughs> Uh, so like if you have a lathe you can literally make any barrel that you can think of out of it right like there's people who have cnc tables that literally just carve all of their things out of wood they can also carve it out of other materials too which we'll get into that tool in a second um, wood in my experience has usually been primarily for two reasons for uh, the inner core of something so that the its structural integrity is like up to sturdiness and then it will be either covered in foam or another uh, material itself but it gives you a good weight and a good uh, strength to work off of. And then the other one has been for the uh, the mold masters for making like uh, cast molds. Mm-hmm. So I will either work with like a plywood or preferably MDF, which is like a more, uh, like it's like sawdust board. Something that's really easy to shape and sand. And... You're able to, since it doesn't need to necessarily like be all that great for like say for like long term like prop use, you can make masters out of it really fast and very like cleanly because you have more control over it. Even if it's like life expectancy isn't great, you can make really cool, interesting shapes uh, way faster than a lot of other materials, and it's strong enough that you can like make like uh, you don't have to worry about when you're creating a mold if you're gonna like break it by handling it. Um, so those are my two uh, my two best uses for it. But like I said before, uh, yeah, like Woodchuck it literally makes whole like blaster rifles out of it, and he just does an amazing job with it. Mm-hmm. Okay. You can go ahead. Yeah. So I mean, the obvious reason that we use wood a lot of times to me is just durability, right? Like, so the fact that you can make you can take a broomstick and literally carve out of it and make a staff, and then you know it's going to stay that way, right? And if you're going to do that out of like a a graphite or a plastic broomstick or something that won't work as well. Um, there are definitely people that have like just wood shops, right? So if that's your material of choice, it's probably because you have access to the tools that cut wood really well. You can do tons with it. You can bend it. You can there's a ton of stuff you can do with it. Um, and then the other thing that uh, is pretty obvious about it that we use before a decent amount is it is really easy to like drill into. And to act like there's a reason people have been using it forever. It's kind of like leather, right? Like it's, there is just leather working and there's woodworking. And you can use those tools and abilities just right the same as he was saying Woodchuck does or anybody else does in prop making. Um, where we use it specifically a lot of times is really if a piece is wood, we can just make it out of wood. We'll either laser cut it out of wood. We'll do a lot of our, our uh, at least base like casts, not casts, but our 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 mold masters. Our mold masters, you know, like he was saying, that where we'll laser cut like a knife and we'll make the entire knife out of wood. We'll be able to cut it down. We'll be able to dremel it down, shave it, sand it. Wood's great for that reason exactly. And then we can put it in a mold and, and mold it. Um, also, what I really like about uh, wood too is filler primer. While we talk about using filler primer all the time on like PLA and like resin, pr- not resin prints, but just uh, FDM prints, right? 3DM, 3D prints. Filler primer literally is made for and goes on wood and makes can make wood super smooth and also can be sanded. So in the same respect that you sand down and the way you work with the 3D print, you can do the same with wood. Yeah. So wood. 
Um, <laughs> what is good? You, we gotta let him go first one of these times, yeah. cause right? No, 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 no. It's fine. I don't. Some yeah. of these I don't have a lot to say, and I, I can pick up the last of the scraps. Because yeah, right. specifically for wood, they talked a lot about building with wood. I'm gonna tell you about organization with wood because that's what I do a lot more mm -hmm. around here with wood, is actually making structures or organizational things so though I, i'm going to speak quickly about one thing that i just find handy every once in a while so when we get different like drill bits or different like all sorts of things like um hex wrenches and all sorts of mm -hmm. stuff i a lot of times will just take like a two by four block of wood and drill large enough holes that they can just sit in. So they're nicely displayed on something and not like inside of a box and you're like going through there and trying to find stuff there. I don't know if we have any in this shop, but our other shop, we have lots of things. It like in one of the corners, there's a screw driving bits, like block of wood that was made and all the little different heads of the bits are on there and labeled or whatever. So you can just store them and have them nicely there. So a lot of times we make just easy display mod, like displays of our tools and things. So it's easier to work on these projects. Um, and a lot of times it's easy to just take a piece of wood. Other uses for wood that I use a lot of times is when we're spray painting stuff and things are sticking to like whatever surfaces we've had because we spray painted a ton on them, whether we put paper or other things down, sometimes they're way too sticky and tacky. And we might have a scrap piece of wood laying around and I'll literally take that out and spray paint on that because it's a nice clean surface. It's not going to get stuck to, um, and it's fairly cheap and we have scrap wood laying around and it can be used later too, even if it has some paint on it to like structure or put on something. So those are just a few quick uses of wood that I use that aren't like the typical making for the specific prop, but helping to make the prop. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, one last closing statement or like cap on wood is, uh, for me, is there's also a lot of craft woods that like uh, model makers will use. So you, like, as far as like using like different sheets of thin plastics, um, they're pretty close to the same levels of thicknesses for craft wood. So if you're not necessarily comfortable with using plastics, if you want to get started with, uh, like working on like that's like really thin scales you can actually look into like craft wood like balsa wood and stuff like that and then the only wood that you're really using is wood glue which is pva glue with like uh like usually like sawdust or something like yeah, that sawdust, bond. Yeah, um so like you can do a a, a much less toxic uh, route if you just want to get started with the model making side of this thing and like we've said before you can make entire props out of it um, if the weight isn't a bother to you. Yeah, he just mentioned that you can use wood glue on it. Well, you know what else you can use on it? The super glue we always glue. use. The CA glue. So, like, another reason it's on our list of things we use all the time is I'll literally glue acrylic to a piece of metal, to a piece of foam, to a piece of wood, That's all with CA glue. We need a right? sandwich. We really just we need do a the sandwich. sandwich. Thing. We'll, we'll post that on Instagram or something, sandwich. right? We'll just get the whole thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I use wood for security, too. I carry a base, wood and baseball <laughs> bat around just in case people yeah, want to mess with me. So, I mean, in case you didn't pick up on it, we, we really like wood. I like wood. Hardwood. To build with. To build with. Hardwood, to, uh, build softwood, with. Yeah, to all build types with. of wood. Yeah, like, that's... So, So like, I, we have, there's a ton of different other materials. Um, and, yeah, go ahead. Real quickly. So, the wood glue and CA glue, um, one way of using it to your advantage is the best bond you'll have wood to wood is wood glue but you can also set like temporary set the bond with ca glue in a couple points so that it doesn't shift it doesn't move so when you're like when you go to clamp wood glue on you just put a couple dots of ca glue in there and it's not going to shift on you while it's curing mm -hmm. yeah that's a that's a big that's a big point right there for sure um again we'll go, move on to a couple others um we'll do rubber and latex at the same time they are very different there's tons of different rubbers tons, tons of different latexes but if we're talking costume making and prop making you gotta remember that they're a thing um, a lot of them are used in stunt props so you'll do a, a cast of a like a rubber cast um, out of a mold right so if you see a lot of rubbers coming out of molds um, you can also use CA glue to put together rubber which is was that that CA glue or other glues that are rubber specific um, and the cool thing about that is it's good for like padding. It's definitely a, just a different texture. Um, we've made a lot, of, a lot of times we'll, we'll go and we'll get like floor mat rubber with different like ribbings and that sort of thing. And we'll put that on parts of costumes or on parts of props. And it definitely like looks cool. It feels a little different, um, but it's still durable. You can still glue it together. It'll hold a screw. It'll, 
do a lot of different things there. So don't forget, I guess, in, in my mind, don't forget about the fact that there is rubber to be used and same like with padding too. Mm -hmm. uh, there we've used them for like like bow seals on things. We've used them for all like literally all kinds of um, different industrial uses. Um, latex is great for sealing things. It's, uh, it's an amazing sealer, um, especially like on foam work and stuff like that there's that's like one of the best that's been used like tried and true for years for like it does like from industrial to you know like hobby it, it just works really well yeah so the last one i want to cover is um I, I, leather and like other soft goods right so sewing we actually don't do a lot of leather work and sewing work in in-house we have a lot of people we work with on that one but i will say this like you can also use leather if you want a leather belt you can just make it out of leather and again that gets down to um combining different materials right and leather working i mean you there's people who've spent their entire life leather working there's tons of videos and everything else on it it's an amazing skill set it's just one that we don't happen to have a lot of um but that's fine because we we do a lot of other things but we do use leather sometimes to wrap or faux leather to like wrap handles um, and again, leather works and glues together with CA glue. So it's, it's like skin. So it's, it works really well on that. Mm -hmm. um, do you have anything to add about leather? Okay, so that, yeah, let's get on to... Um, we yeah, talked about... Kind of we've talked about so we talked about leather. adhesives. We did talk about that a bit. We've, we've talked about that on our other videos too. Um, really, like the last thing I want to say specifically on like adhesives is like... Contact cement is amazing. Uh, a couple of tips and tricks and things I like to do on contact cement is for people who haven't used contact cement, the way it works is you put two, you have two pieces of whatever it is that you're gluing together, put contact cement on this side, put contact cement on this side, and then you have to let it dry and then put it together. A cool thing that you can do is you can run air over it, it's either with, with a fan or a like hair dryer on That's, cold. Yeah. On cold because you don't want it to heat it don't use your heat gun on it but if you run air over top of your contact cement it will let it dry faster which will cut down your wait time because a lot of people a lot of times people don't want to use contact cement because it takes like five to ten minutes to set up and then go that is a really really strong bond but the cool thing about it and the, the cool thing about it is it's a strong bond the bad thing about it is it's a one shot yep right so like there's no good luck apart. pulling that apart um, and then with the part of the reason we really like CA glue so much is it's crazy versatile to the point of you can glue a bunch of things together. We use it to fill holes. And feel free to interrupt me too, sorry. Mm -hmm. But we, we use it to fill holes on a lot of things. Fill this hole. Um, there's a lot of, yeah, right. Ah, don't put CA <laughs> no. glue in your mouth. That's a terrible idea. Mm. Quaid. Um, we'll talk about that story in a minute about safety. Um, but yeah, um, CA glue really is very very versatile and they also have a zip kicker or i don't know what we an call activator it? activator i call it zip kicker because i was started in model making and that's what they call it so what you can do is it's a little spray bottle you spray it we might have some around here you spray it on whatever you want to do then you put your super glue on it and it literally like instantly sets much like what contact cement does so again, we recommend that there's obviously hot glues. There's a two-part epoxies. We've covered that in some of our other videos. Um, and then there's like there's there's all kinds of different adhesives, but also putting things together, uh, screws, and literally like actually getting into it. Um, one of our favorite things to use are like Chicago screws, right? And we'll kind of cover that a little bit more, maybe in ma making things break down or move. Or post um, screws. Everything has like three names. Yeah, everything. There's all everything sorts of different names. things. But I want I want to talk about safety for a second. I have a story to tell you. Um, Quaid has a pretty bad habit of. I think it's about habits because I yeah. habits. Yeah. You want? It's just you about should tell the story. You want you me to tell the story? You want to tell? There we go. We'll let him tell. I'll I'll tell the story since yeah, they yeah, give me a hard time about it. But um, it's just something that I've picked up as a habit. Like when I first started making things, and it's still still hard to kick. You know, everyone has a habit. Mm -hmm. It's hard to kick. Is it actually using my mouth on a lot of things I shouldn't be? Like, I, I don't know if it's something growing up or something. I, like, used to I'd use your teeth for use my teeth for lots of things, right? Mm -hmm. um, when, instead of, like, getting a tool to do it. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
with the super glue, sometimes when you're using the kicker or the insecure, it'll like set over the tip of it. So it like clumps up and gets like clogged up that you can't use it unless you like literally cut it again or get something and like scrape all the stuff off. So a lot of times I'll just like bite it off and then spit it out or whatever. <laughs> so don't do um, this. So I'm putting toxic chemicals in my mouth and I realize this, I have to stop myself a lot from doing it, but sometimes like I said in the last panel, sometimes it's just the closest and easiest thing mm -hmm. there. So I do that. And if I don't have something near me, that's why I do it. So that's why I have to sometimes put things near me so I don't do that. Mm -hmm. But another thing using my mouth, if you want to hear bad safety things is... What not to do. Uh, what not to do is lots of people have used hot glue, right? Um, I don't know how this became a habit. But a lot of times, like if I got it on my hand or somewhere else, because hot glue's hot, right? You're burning yourself or whatever. I instantly put it in my mouth because <laughs> it basically cools it. cools it quick enough that to the temperature that it just like dries. And I never had like issues burning my mouth except for like maybe once I got my tongue somehow and I had a little like, like burn on my tongue. But 99% of the time, I would put it in my mouth to cool. Still not a good idea. No, no. Don't but worry. this is things not to do, but things out of habits that I just tend to do because they work. But it's still not good for you, even this if is, it works. So. This is, this so is you why go. you need so, to be very yeah. focused on safety because yeah. it's very easy to form a habit that could be bad. Yeah, for I understand it's bad for me, but sometimes yeah. it happens. So just don't do it. Don't, don't even get in the habit of it. How about that? There yeah. we go. Avoid these little Yeah, costs. so we're telling you this not because we want you to do it. We want you not to do it. Yeah, I'm not saying that's a good tip that you need to yeah. do. It just works so, for me. <laughs> but but actually, that's a very good point because we all have bad habits. Literally, yeah. I can go across the board. I'm sure people watching have bad habits too. And it, what you were saying is like having the right tools there, having the things there. Yeah. That's incredibly important. And I, I want to cover that because it is kind of a, a more advanced building, right? Cleaning up your area, having your area like to the point where you're working efficiently is part of the advanced building aspect of it. Like... Before, when I was doing this more of a, as a hobby, I would not have the right things in the right places, and I would do things with cutting corners. I would not go get my safety equipment and put it on right away. So, again, really, really, like, don't, let's not do that. Uh, thanks for the story, though, Quake. But, but, but also, yeah. here, here's another one that yeah, yeah, isn't yeah. even my bad habit, but, sure. like, a habit that I can see not be a total big problem, but you probably shouldn't do is... Like, James is, like, in the past when he's gotten CA glue on his hands. Because we're talking about how to adhesives. It's things not to do yeah. with them, right? Yeah. Like, it's just like, no, you could just, like, take sandpaper and use that on your hands. You're probably ripping a lot of skin off your hands. Probably. Maybe it's not that bad for your hands, whatever. But the thing you could do to protect yourself from that is just wear gloves. Mm -hmm. Like, wear latex gloves or whatever type of gloves. So you're not getting the stuff on your hands to even have to get off your hands. Because we still get CA glue all over our hands or whatever. But you don't want to have to be using Uncure all the time. And the chemicals of it are probably not good for your hands. These things, types things, right? So once again, another protective equipment that with an adhesive can help you, right? Like, Oh, I mean, if you're going to bring up that story, then we can bring up that story. Why not? It's story time about yeah, stuff you that go. you shouldn't do. St stuff you um, probably shouldn't do with so adhesives, thing, right? Okay, <laughs> we're, just, we're going to go into adhesive. We're talking about it already. Um, yeah, there's a thing called Maxi Cure Super Glue, which we like a lot and we use all the time. It's, it sticks that to this to that all the time. It works really well on your skin. Um, what it also has, made by the same company, is they have Uncure, which is a solvent that actually just like gets stops the the bond from happening right so i would just, say just like the other one is green not pink we sell these on our websites uh, on our website um but you can also just get it off amazon and sell bob smith or anywhere else and go to bob smith um they have a bunch of different ways of using this and all their other ones but the story that i want to tell you is we well the stories i guess the overarching thing of the shop is that we have had to use this to get people unglued from what? Oh, Tables God. and like so, tools and everything else. And I, I think he's got a specific story that he wants to talk about. Okay. Because we're on this train. We have we have left we have left the train. Right. We're on this train wrecked. Chugga, okay. Chugga, yeah. chugga, 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 chugga. That's we have had here. to use <laughs> yeah, thanks, uncure man. to remove people from tools, themselves, tables, desks, I think the bus. I think the bus was one. Yeah, just lots of things. But I had shown somebody who 
in the shop, um, how to use it. And it was like a week later, I get, hey, I, I was, I think, I, was like, I need a favor. <laughs> I'm like, oh no. He's like, I'm on the other side. I'm not, I'm not paying attention. He's like, I think I've glued myself to the desk. And I just turn around and I just see this guy just like trying to like remove himself from the desk. And he had just gotten a little careless with how much he was gluing things. And his hands in the desk were really good friends. Um, but best friend. that definitely got him out of that situation. It wasn't me, guys. <laughs> it wasn't me. <laughs> yeah. And, and honestly, I... I love those kind of stories because they're what not to do. And we, we're going to try to cover more of those type of things. Oh God. Not the story what time. not to do, but the stories kind of in the panels because this is how we like to have panels go. Yeah, we made so the mistakes So I'm going to put these you. two on spots on the spot oh, no. about story time like from here on out. Okay. Um, but yeah, like going down through, so that's some adhesives. There's a lot of different things you can do with it. Um, but I will say that during our like during some of the other things like the fabrication that we're going to talk about we'll tell we'll talk about using all these different adhesives um so one thing that we get asked a lot about is making a prop move okay so making prop move is definitely one that you, you know you need to know how to do um if it's a sword that folds out like voltron craziness and it's from a cartoon you probably aren't going to be able to make it work exactly how it did in the arc in the cartoon but that's why you can get really creative with it um as far as like getting your 3d modeler to um, bash his head against the wall for a little while then come back to you and charge you more money to do that or whatever but there, there you can make props move so there's a lot of different ways you can do it um I want to talk on uh, like one or two and then pass it over. But yeah, so one of my favorite ways of making it move and break down is like to put a, you know, a Chicago screw or a screw of some sort into it. So you can, what you can do, there's all kinds of these little fittings and these, some of these are, none of these are Chicago screws. Uh, actually. No, none of these are Chicago screws. Have but if you don't, know, look it up on the internet. So, um, in general, what you can do is you can put things on pivots, right? So it's a screw that doesn't actually like hold tight, but it still holds the things together. So you can make, you can make props move. You can make um, literal sights pop up and fold down. Um, the other super like easy way to do to make props move is to buy things that already move and then kit bash with them or add to them. So you'll see a lot of like the guys that do all the props for the expanse use a bunch of airsoft guns. We do a lot of that too. Um, and they will have working triggers and working all everything and you just put greeblies or you put added parts onto the airsoft and then you have mo working moving parts you have working slides all that stuff it doesn't have to be airsoft it can be other replica guns or it can be something else like I said swords also work um, we've done we covered this a little bit and some of our other stuff too mm -hmm. but you can build off of things that already work and the one I wanted to talk about specifically was we were building wings and I went to Menards and found a hardware store and I and um, I found a like thing that it literally was for an uh, umbrella but it would clip on like the side of your chair and it had all it was made of like super durable plastic and it had a bunch of little like hinges all throughout the entire thing so you could position it wherever you wanted and you just had to press it and, and move it in it's perfect for wings perfect for costume wings right so you can literally attach one of those on each side and then it now can go up and you can position them any different way you want. It's quote unquote movable. You can bring the, you can move the wings down. Um, we could also probably go into a lot of stuff about wings and that sort of thing as well. But that's the one I wanted to share real quick because it's a pretty, um, it's a pretty easy, but also like what I want to go with is advanced to the point of you need to make sure to keep your eye out for those kind of things and to understand there's a lot of really really useful things around you that you don't have to completely fabricate and you can't probably 3d print that durable um what else you got um this is this is more of like a, most people understand the basic concepts of how something moves like a charging handle of a gun or a trigger of a gun or like a hinge right but if you're trying to specifically recreate something you're just having a hard time like wrapping your head around exactly how it all works or possibly like how you could make it work in a specific way. It's not a bad idea to take apart something that has that function or something similar. Like there's plenty of like toy guns out there that have foldable triggers. 
five, spend five dollars and open up a gun that has a pullable trigger and a moving slide and see how that it was manufactured to have those things and then you can see the physical things in motion in movement so that you can have an understanding of how those things work on an internal scale mm -hmm. so that you're able to possibly implement those into others as well yeah mm -hmm. so kind of piggybacking off that not even just like guns and things if you're trying to make a prop that mm -hmm. you just want to slide away unfold in a certain way think about just objects in your life that might do that so whether it's like your cabinet doors they're on some type of hinge right mm -hmm. so if you need something to open up this way and stop at a certain point that could be the type of hinge you need. If you need something to slide in and out, like a knife to slide out of a gauntlet, right? Your drawers slide out sometimes. What is the side hinges on a drawer? And even if you just go to hardware stores, they have mini versions of this, big versions, ones you can cut down, or even recreate these same ideas, like a sliding hinge or whatever would just be like two shaped pieces sliding in and out of it. Yeah. You could even make it yourself out of plastics or some of the other materials we've talked about. So you don't, but they also make lots of store-bought things like that. So just like looking at your everyday items and the function you're looking for it to do mm -hmm. to recreate that. A lot of our gauntlets and things we make, we put a nice um, hinge going down the middle piano of it. Hinge, yeah, a piano hinge. So it will it will open up or whatever, and then we can do other things that like are other hinges that will clasp or link on uh, for whatever kind of function we're kind of looking to so your prop can actually open up so your body can go in it and then it can close and then we can there's all sorts of different types of clasps and things like that as well so mm -hmm. um just thinking about what kind of function you need in it and then looking at everyday items because someone's already done the math of how it actually works or it's on a ball and moves around or things like this and you can also build off of things that are already made like that aren't just movable triggers and things specifically for like weaponry like if you're looking for armor or other things that are technically props right so yeah, yeah, definitely. kind of piggyback back off his idea. And that right? kind of brings us into this. So talk about this for a second. Right? So like we've talked about breaking down things. So whether you're shipping them or you need to get them to a con or in your vehicle or all sorts of things. So we found out all sorts of ways. He said there's PVC pipes and things you can use steel poles and do stuff. But we've also figured out that there's different types of like threaded hardware threaded hardware right like that are used for all different types of things so like for instance the microphone stand that i'm using right now i had to buy a specific i had to buy a specific size to get this to go to this because they were two different sizes all right so you could have the same size or two different size things yeah. and buy specific hardware that's not that expensive you can buy like six to ten packs of these things or whatever that screw and unscrew and you can put inside of pipes or other props or things so your actual items can unscrew they can go from bigger to smaller in a lot of times right like this goes to like a smaller type of thing or even just has a cool shape if you needed this on the end and you just needed it to unscrew completely from something like it could just screw in so lots of different there's all sorts of things out there that you can use that you just might not think about too, right? Like, how do I break it down? There's only one way. There's millions of ways, but lots of it is like threading things. You can use bolts, as he said before, to bolt things together that you take the bolt out and it was literally just through a hole in PVC that connected two pieces. And then you can take that out and then just put it together later with like a good butterfly nut or all sorts of things mm -hmm. to just do it real quick if you don't have the proper tools with you to tighten, right? So, yeah. We could go for days, right? Yeah, no, we could go for days on that for sure. But very specifically, though, um, like he, he mentioned earlier, threaded rod, right? So there's there's threaded rods that you can use, and they actually have, you know, couplers that go over those threaded rods. They're threaded for a reason. So mm -hmm. you can just put a metal threaded rod down through your prop and then have a little bit of it sticking out and then just put the coupler on it to the point where you can unscrew it and your staff comes apart in three different ways. Um, and then very specifically... You can order just like a pack of uh, what these are. They're like digital camera, like or, or they're like stands, they're right? like mic and camera like and they're yeah converters for when you have tripods or other types of things that you might need or we'll yeah post for a lights link to and them, everything. Yeah, the best part about them is they have different sizes and they flip out and everything else is great. They're pretty inexpensive. They're aluminum, so they're lightweight, but I think they're aluminum anyway. Yeah, but they're, I'm pretty sure they're aluminum. They're, they're durable, and we've used this on tons of different props just to like make a silencer pop on and off, and random just breaking things down. 
And when I when we discovered these and a few other things, like that's the truth of the game that's for us. definitely a game changer. I've also seen people use pool cues and like the pool cue unscrew part. Which those right? are very similar. Which they're they're very similar, but like actually you can build off of a pool cue. So if you're building a staff and you want to just buy a, a used pool cue, one that you can take apart, then there you go. You can mm -hmm. make a breakdown. And then a lot of it is like just disguising your prop where it comes apart, right? So either put like you know a piece of leather or foam or something over a wrap or on that seam or just make build that seam into it as well when it breaks apart. So when we're talking about breaking apart. And then also there's uh, for both breaking apart and um and moving we have these amazing little magical things called magnets you want to talk on some magnets the magnets yeah. are awesome yeah so magnets are one of those things that as soon as you start thinking about using them as um or using them for movement as like instead of using a spring using a magnet with reverse polarity to push something away so that when you flip a switch it just pushes it away instead of having to have a spring like compressed in there or um, in some ways there's not enough space in a prop for a spring or at least there's not a good space for a spring but there's always space for like neodymium like rare earth magnets which don't use fridge magnets those don't work just just please don't <laughs> yeah they don't want angry comments being like magnets don't work young was lied to if they're rare earth magnets please use those instead yeah most of the time you'll have to order them online as most places don't carry really good ones because most people are like, most places are like, oh yeah, fridge magnets. Um, but you can get packs of them, like like 50 packs of like small ones for like 10 bucks. So it might not be a bad idea just to have some on hand just for like a bunch of different uses. Um, we actually use the use magnets as a clasp system for one of the helmets that we sell. Like, so you can use them in a lot of different ways other than just holding two things together in the traditional sense or holding a thing to something else mm -hmm. yeah and if you want to instead of making this swivel like on this if you put a magnet on it and you have a strong magnet you can just it can click on there and then it'll swivel just like any other magnet just but as far as movement goes look into magnets look into springs combined with magnets right so a lot of times it'll be um just to make sure things fit exactly mm -hmm. right so the the magnets are really helpful uh, you know, it might you might be something that you can put into their prop, and it's maybe it's a cartridge, like a an ammo cartridge or something you're putting into a sci-fi prop. If you have that magnetized with one magnet, it'll hit in and it'll spin. It might not look right, but if you put three or whatever, you it has to go right in that same spot, or four or five or whatever it is, right? So you can look at them to make them come apart and make them work a lot, a lot more like they actually would normally function with magnets when you use them in that respect. What do you got about magnets? Yeah, so for instance, he said we use magnets on one of the helmets we have. It's great, kind of like sometimes, like a piece of elastic on pants, it gives you a little stretch. If you make a, a metal bar long enough with a magnet, it can slide down that bar so like your helmet can adjust a little bit bigger so it's not only one size, right? So because of the way we make the mask, we have a hinge up here but the magnet allows you to get extra room if you just need a little extra room for your face to pull it off of it because that magnet go is still connecting the helmet to the back part and up top or whatever, but you can extend it and we have just like rubber lining here too. So it covers so you're not seeing your face mm -hmm. still, but it can adjust kind of a little bit more than you want when we're talking about movement in a prop um, that helps kind of give you a little elasticity to a prop or something too to fit you better even if it was a gauntlet right oh yeah it could move a little get a little bit wider in that gap for you because the magnet can is just like actually making contact with the metal in there so if you have a longer magnet not just like the circle magnet like a longer barred magnet and, right um yeah, yeah exactly and, and a good follow-up to that is so say for example like you have like a rifle or something yeah. like that and you don't necessarily want it to come apart but like say like it you can make it so that it slides out mm -hmm. into place. Mm -hmm. You can use magnets on the on the um, origin point of how far it can go back to slide into, and the or the end point of how far it can extend out. Yeah, we do that a lot. Yeah, we we had a uh, a prop that was like a knife that like like a. Uh, it was a blade, the blade from the blade movie, the blade punch dagger that he has. Yeah. Um, so we just made put magnets at the bottom, yeah, magnets so on the top. Instead of having like. Uh, a situation where 
like you would have to have springs in the latch that mm -hmm. held the springs. We had two sets of magnets at the beginning and the end. So you basically would move it forward and then it would push off of the um, one set of magnets and then it would get pulled to the other one. So it would immediately just slide up into the and other position. Yeah. position. I want to be really clear though too that it, you do need to use pretty strong magnets. And like the the things I've seen these guys come up with and I've come up with a few of them myself, but some, one of the things that Quay came up with which was great was a gauntlet system. So when we clasped it together, well, he was on the piano uh, hinge, we clasped it together. It used magnets to hold, but then it had actual pegs. So it really wasn't coming apart unless you really, really pulled on it. So you're not just using the magnets. The magnets are there to guide it and to hold it a little bit more, mm -hmm. but the pegs itself, that it wasn't like we took pegs. So and you won't have afterwards. that movement and it won't open up. That's kind of why I had to peg it as well. So if it tries sliding, it won't slide too far because it's pegged in. So because of that movement, unless they're super, super strong, they might have a little bit of movement within them. So Yeah, yeah so we do that a lot. And um, I mean, it's always, every project's different. That's part of the fun of it. Um, but I do recommend that if you want to make things move or, or slide together or slide, magnets are great for that, for sure. Mm -hmm. And there's all kinds of different strengths and everything else. All right, so moving on. So, so another question we get a lot is lights and sound. Like, how do you mm -hmm. put lights? How do you put sound in things? Well, first of all, there's sound boards and, like, Arduino um, uh, computer systems and a bunch of stuff we can go into. We don't do a whole lot of that. We do have um, a few people we work with really closely that do that. Um, but as far as like we've covered it before, a lot of our lights are, you know, we can build off of really cool flashlights, right? That we can actually put into and magnetize into our props. Mm -hmm. And then we like can cover that with different color acrylics, that sort of thing. And then going into it, I want to talk, uh, and there's a lot more that we do on lights too. But one of the things I use lights for a bunch is acrylic. So again, if I want a, instead of using like a gel, I'll just do a piece of, acrylic that is a certain um there's a certain color i'll laser cut it to to fit it or you can actually take a light and put it directly on the edge of an acrylic piece if it's a clear acrylic piece and that will make the whole thing kind of glow uh you can like literally glue it in there too you could probably magnetize it in there they make like little uh like globe night light things that are exactly that they literally have they have leds in the globe you they're laser cut clear pieces you can put them in you can put like all kinds of different characters or whatever in there, that's exactly what they're doing there. So you can do the same thing for prop making. Um, then you want to talk on more lights? Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, to start out, usually usually you'd want to go with a, like a pre-setup thing. Um, plenty of online retailers have like LED strips, and a lot of them you can mm -hmm. cut and re-solder. So not only can you make them fit just about any pattern of string light that you possibly like want, but it's a very versatile without you having to manually put them onto a strip and then wire the strip and then wire each and every one of those. Um, there's also ones that have controllers so that you can select the color of mm -hmm. each one of them too. So you can have many different options just off the start using a system like that. Um, and like a lot of them have wireless controllers too. So you can just have it like in the back pocket and you can just turn it on or off. Um, Another big thing with lighting is actually the diffusal of the lights, which is where most of the uh, most of the main starting mistakes is not diffusing lights properly. Um, the two big ones that at least come to mind um, right now, without having to go into like a huge um, huge thing, is to sand down the LEDs themselves so that they, there's a rough surface and it scatters the light. And to spray a diffusal spray paint glaze on the inside or the outside of um, of whatever mesh, plastic, mm -hmm. or glass pieces on the outside of it. Um, both of those, both having on the inside and the outside, do give a little bit different type of lighting, um, so that you would need to know which type that you would want and you would want to play around with that. Um, but diffusing lights properly will literally take it from oh that looks like a push light that like i've walked by it like you know walmart like a thousand times to that looks really good i wonder how he wired it mm -hmm. so like diffusal is extremely important 
Um, I've even known that some people like will literally do like construction paper and weird other things mm-hmm. where they'll literally place that on top of it on just where the like light, like the LEDs, the individual ones are, mm-hmm. just to break it up like a lot. Because a lot of times you need glow, you don't need light. Um, and there's ways to do a glow without lighting it, but that's a painting thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but start with start with some lights. There's even um, EVA foam that is uh, has a certain transparency to it so that you can actually light it. That's another thing. Um, I know Kamui does a good job of showing how that works. Um, if you want to get into wiring everything yourself and to like program lights, Arduino and um, Arda Fruit. Arda Fruit. There's another one. There's a couple computer like small, uh, small computer companies that do oh, yeah. like programmable boards. Um, they have components, anything from components to pre-made kits. You can. Um, I know, like with some, like there's people that sell pre-made, like put together stuff. Like there's people that literally do. This is for all of the Star Wars blasters. Like this is just, mm-hmm. a, it's a speaker, it's a board, it's a plug-in, mm-hmm. like everything the way it goes. Yep. So like there's a lot of already done work out there too. If if it's not your thing, but you really want it for a project, um, be sure just to look around, ask around. Um, yeah, there's a lot of options with lighting. Okay, you want yeah um my only small thing about lighting too is when we talk about some of these flashlights and some of these other things is um there is the ability sometimes to remove the lighting from the housing and the buttons that actually trigger and turn it on um so if you have a prop you're like i can't fit this whole flashlight in my prop to make it light up or whatever what you need is the light and the battery thing that's powering it and the ground wire and some of that stuff you still have to be semi careful and know a little bit about lighting, um, just so you're not gonna like start a fire. I guess. it's not necessarily gonna start a fire with that yeah. small of a battery or whatever, or shock yourself or something, right? But you can remove the housing and actually put your trigger somewhere, and it's already pre-wired for you. So we talk about things being pre-wired. A flashlight is pre-wired with a button and all the wiring that needs, and you can remove it a lot of times without damaging, and it'll still work and enter it in your prop, but make sure you're housing it in a different way. So obviously it's not getting, the wires aren't coming loose or like getting pulled from the triggers and other things you need. But a lot of times I'll just like take the lights out of flashlights and other things and insert them in other types of props to get the type of lighting I need. And then you can diffuse the lighting with your different plastics and stuff we talked about earlier and sprays and other things that is actually on your prop, but that light can just go under that, if that makes sense. Right, yeah. and, so, and that, yeah. no, that's that's great points, because a lot of it is um, getting to the whole, you know, the reason we're doing this is to, to spread the knowledge that we that we have and that other people have given to us. Um, a lot of it isn't that incredibly difficult. It's a matter of figuring out, okay, well, this is the thing that already exists, or this is the thing that's already pre-wired, how can I use this as a thing? Um, that being said, knowing how to basic solder isn't too bad, and it's something you probably are going to need to do. You can also, there's a lot of different, like, wire connection kits and things like that, that, um, like, uh, plastic wrap, I forget what it's called at the moment, but you basically can just hit it with a heat gun, and it'll it'll shield it, and what's great is Mm -hmm. it's not too bad once you get into it, but when it it gets right down to it, if you're, depending on how you're making it, if you're making it for... A movie that they're going to use over and over and over you want to make sure it's really high quality and it's going to be to the point where it's really well done if it's for yourself and you just want it to look like it's light and it's not there's some really cool things you can do and i want to touch on that real quick mm-hmm. which is um you know you can paint it to look like it's light which that's just a painting different painting techniques but there's also you can use um, um like reflective tape we've done that before and if you're going around like a convention or if you're shooting a movie and you don't have a whole lot of budget for lights but you want it to look really cool in the background, if you have somebody who has a helmet and you have some pieces of reflective tape that you've cut down and there's lights like that are on us right now, those are going to be reflective. And especially when they're continual lights. Sometimes it works with flashes, sometimes it doesn't. But that's a really cool way of making like, um, I guess, faux lights, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also like what I mentioned, like day glow. Um, you know, you can have a lot, a lot of times people ask me how I made certain things glow and I'm like, or how I, how I lit certain things up. And I'm like, 
that what they didn't have any lights in it at all. That was just literally acrylic that I had cut down in a certain way, um, and literally just on the laser cutter. And it hits the way it hits the light, especially after you hit it with clear coat. Um, when you cut a clear acrylic, you want to hit it with clear coat. That's kind of another uh, tool or tip I can use do later. But what it does is it catches that light quite a bit. So even though it doesn't have any lights in it at all because it's a fluorescent um, acrylic. It'll look like it's glowing. It'll look like there's lights in there, especially just even if there's not that much light in the actual room, but even outside. And you, it, what's cool about that is when you're using lights too, and if you're outside, a lot of cosplayers will be like, man, I don't like these lights because when I'm out in my main convention or if I'm outside taking, like doing a photo shoot or something, if it's not dark, a lot of times your lights aren't going to show up. For Luckily for like movie sets, that sort of thing, they can control the lighting, which is awesome. But if you want a Green Lantern ring that's lighting up and glowing... You might be better off, like a lot of the people that I do, I, I do a light that's in there, but then I'll also do like a ring of acrylic, and that acrylic ring is just that day glow stuff, and it looks like it's, it's lit up and it's it's glowing, and they'll then go outside in the middle of the day, and it'll look like their their Green Lantern is is blown up. Yeah. So. And go, going along with that, there's so for instance, if you're making something for cosplay that you're gonna go get photos taken with, right? And the end of your gun, sometimes people use different things to, so like specifically when you're planning your project, like this is only going to be for photo shoots and for my cosplay, things like this. A lot of times they're out in their cosplays during the day and not nighttime, so it's not going to be glowing, things like that. There's different reflective tapes and other things, like for instance, they use on stop signs so people can see Mm -hmm. it like when Mm -hmm. light hits it. So as a photographer takes a picture and it hits the muzzle of your gun or something, it'll look like almost like bright, like if it hits it in the right ways, the light sometimes, so it looks like you're firing it or other types of things or a red glow in certain areas that you can play with the lighting reflecting off what's on your weapon as well. So just wanted to throw that in there yeah. too because it's other alternative ways of lighting an item not specifically you're providing the light something else and that, that really brings me back to a, a big point that i wanted to cover in this specifically is and we covered this in our other panels um you always have to make sure you're building for whatever it is that you're making right so if you are doing a movie prop it's going to be different than a, than a photo shoot prop then it's going to be different than a cosplay prop that you have to walk around. People are going to see it from all different sides, and they're going to see it really close. If you're doing something for just a, a video shoot or something, a lot of times it doesn't have to be that crazy detailed, or it doesn't even have to be painted on one side or put together on one side. So all this stuff put in mind, that's a, like a, one of the biggest tricks is just talk to the director, talk to the person, talk to the person that you're making it for, and ask them what it's actually used for, because you might not even have to paint the backside because that, they don't want it for that, right? Um, so yeah, I want to talk about durability. All right, let's talk about durability for a second. Um, Dur. the reason we use a lot of the, the materials we talked about earlier is durability, specifically ABS is a great plastic for being durable. Um, PETG, same way. Um, you can do different resins, you can do ca- like when you do casting, you can do something we like to call the tough cast, which we cast like bracers and random other things that we know that people are going to be using for stunts. Um, literally, you can kick them around, and they're, they're fine. Foam is also super durable. Um, but we we get a lot of questions on durability and, like, actually even testing durability. The thing is, some props are display props. Again, they are literally meant to be on a mantle or something. They are not going to be dropped very much. Uh, a lot of the 3D printed pop props, things like that, aren't really meant to be thrown on the ground. If it's cast in rubber, it will be. But what are some ways that you, like either building props or costume pieces, tend to want to make durability, like how how do you test durability and also like what are are some ways you make it more durable? Okay, so a few things for that. Biggest things that come to mind are just always reinforce things if you absolutely can. Like we mentioned earlier, having wood cores on like foam like projects, right? Um, mm-hmm. Having things secured by bolts and screws instead of just glue. Um, it's mostly a matter of like, if you're looking at your project, you're looking at your piece, what do you think is the most like, what part do you think will come off the first and try to reinforce that? Mm-hmm. Like, right? Yeah. So think of if you drop this or if someone knocked into it, 
Or if you turned a corner too fast and you just clipped it, what would break first? And then work back from that. Definitely, definitely. That's, um, that's a great question. Yeah, so yeah, just always work back from your worst case scenario, what you can fix. Because there's just some things you're not going to be able to account for. Because like, oh, uh, you dropped this and it landed flat. And then like, it just cracked like a weird like fracture line. And you just didn't know that like, the, the piece mm -hmm. of wood you had had a fault line <laughs> in it. Like, yeah. there's some things you're just not going to be able to be prepared for. But if you can think about what would break first if it if you were to break it and then work back from there, that's going to be your best bet for trying to reinforce those areas. Mm -hmm. Use epoxy instead of hot glue. Use bolts instead of just use bolts and glue instead of just glue. Have solid cores on your props. Make sure that if it's a like stunt thing make sure that it's either cast out of a, a, a softer resin that can be that can handle it make sure your props aren't weirdly colored underneath the bases like green or orange don't do that please um also uh like things are just going to break because that's just the nature of things. So as much as you want to make them durable, understand too that fixing them is going to be probably something, at least for your own props, you're going to have to do. But yeah, work back through your processes. Durability. Hmm. So I tend to just lead them around the shop a little bit because <laughs> they usually look pretty cool. And there's a few people around the shop that tend to play with anything they see. And they'll usually break them if they're not... <laughs> they will. But, go, but they going will. along with that, it's like, for instance, if you're making a costume, I know we're talking about a lot of props or whatever, you would, a lot of times, if you're making a costume for yourself, you would not wear it the first day that you're going to be presenting it. You'd wear it around the house. It, like a new pair of shoes, right? You're going to wear them out, uh, wear them around for a while in the house. So you see if you're getting blisters or how they're wear, wearing and tearing. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of times with props and other things, like where the most wear and tear is going to go. Like I might reinforce the paint around a trigger and stuff because the paint from the trigger is going to get worn off a lot quicker than other stuff if it's a pullable trigger because someone's going to be constantly resting their hand there or on the back part. So really making sure that we really paint those well, like that it's not going to rub off and you're going to see the under paint from that because there's lots of wear and tear in certain areas doing it enough or like holding it or resting your arm. Like, okay, my arm's constantly touching this part. Let's make sure we maybe wrap it in leather here or do something like that. So a lot of times it's just like actually putting it in use, whether it is leaving around the shop so someone is playing with it and breaks it or actually like trying it out and using it and knowing where those stress points are that Seth was kind of talking about. Yeah, really, that, that brings me like the two things I was going to say about it, which is one, you know, really a phrase I use a lot of times is literally shake it till you break it, right? Like a lot of costumes we do, we want to... We'll get in them or props that we use. We'll shake them around and we'll throw them around if it's a sword. We want to be able to shake it around. You want to be able to play with it. And I'd rather them break in our shop and us know what happened to them or, and be able to reinforce it than, than, you know, break for the customer or break when they're out on a set. Um, and so definitely just, you know, be rough on it. And also, the other thing too, and I, I say this all the time in other panels, but man, if you say while you're building something, man... This might break. It's going to break. Okay, <laughs> wherever that is. Yep. Wherever that one, if it's the seam or wherever the hell you're talking about, right? It's going to break. Trust like, your gut. You trust your gut. Reinforce it. Reinforce it ahead of time. I mean, if it's a if it's a sword and it's like a pretty durable sword, maybe you put like, you know, a metal rod all the way down through it, but then there's a like really thin piece where it's just basically the metal rod and the, the sword, it's probably going to break there. If you're looking at it and saying, "Hey, it's going to break here." Obviously, for some props, you can't help it because they have to be that certain, like, if it's a rapier or whatever, then it has to be super thin. But for the most part, you can see and you can be like, man, this costume piece, this helmet, this whatever it is that I'm working on, I think it's going to break here or it might break here. It's going to break there. Reinforce it right away, right then. Um, so is that it for durability? Yeah. Yep. All right. So... Advanced cosplay, or not cosplay, advanced uh, prop making. Tools oh. and fabrication. Are we oh. still going? We've been talking forever, so I'm yeah, just Yeah, sorry, like, our, ca our yeah. camera is doing a battery switcher. It's changing yeah. some things out. Let's sorry. figure that out. Yeah, we've been talking a lot. Um, mm -hmm. So, 
we might so cut these down a little about? bit. But we, yeah. I think we'll talk. We were going to talk a little bit about some fabrication and tools that are handy and a few tips with them, but we won't go super detailed because we can do a whole panel on just fabricating and just tools. So yeah, let's go, let's into go a over couple, a, couple, a couple real world like tips and, yeah, and yeah. deep dive into like an actual like. This is a, a tip that I use all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, Right? And so I'll go first. One of the ones I wrote down was, um, so, for example, on my laser cutter, I realized by accident that if you take two pieces of clear acrylic mm -hmm. and cut them with the laser on top of each other, mm -hmm. right? Like I take an eighth inch and eighth inch. And put them on down, and I take the laser all the way through it. It will bind that together. It'll sear it. And it'll sear it. So it literally, I didn't have to use glue. It gives a perfect like. There's no glue that you see in that clear, so it'll bind those together. And you can even put like a picture or something else in there, and then laser cut around it, and then it'll be stuck in there, right? And it's it is clear and it's beautiful. And also, you can hit acrylic. There's a lot of working with acrylic that I want to talk about, um, but you can hit it with a flame, and then also when you laser cut it, uh, you can also hit it with a clear coat. Um, which is awesome. It looks, it's all cloudy when you laser cut acrylic or sometimes ABS. You hit it with a clear coat, um, like a shiny gloss clear coat, and it literally clears it up. It's crazy. It's like magic. So that's that's something I wanted to make sure that I, I, I've got in here. What other tips like that you have? Um, well, first and foremost, we're probably going to have several more of mm -hmm. these discussions yeah. as we, we haven't even begun to, like, to talk about like laser cutting or even yeah. like 3D printing or any of these things. So just... We'll be probably talking a lot more about this. Um, one of the big, 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 big pieces of advice is that I cannot stress enough is to just keep trying new things, especially when it comes to the same process, just done slightly different. Um, one of the examples is weathering. I know we didn't get to talk about painting in this one, but we'll talk about it in another one. Um, was figuring out weathering techniques. We found like a good way we could weather things. Um, and it worked really well for like generally per general purpose, everything. And then basically I was able to figure out like, Hey, like with the greasing and then mm -hmm. like the yeah, weathering on top of it, um, you can create very good effects with that, without going too much into it. You can create really good effects by doing multiple layers of like a paint, of course, obviously. But if you think that there's something maybe missing from what you're doing, look up and research more ways of, do, of doing that same thing and see how people do the thing that you're doing and see if there's just a little bit differences that you can make that can make it a lot better. Because I'm pretty sure there's somebody out there doing something similar just in a different way as everybody who does this stuff has things that they do just a little bit different. So maybe that's enough to help push you forward with the project that you're working on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some stuff. Hmm. Um, because there's a million tools and a million ways to do things that I think about. So I just want to like sum up something I constantly harp on too is like having things near you. So we have a million tools. Like you see a bunch of tools here. Our other shop has a bunch of the tools that aren't even here. Like use the right tools for the right job, but they have to also be accessible. So like a lot of times, like I've said about safety or other things, you get lazy like you you're like i don't want to go out to the chop shop and chop this when it'll take me a second and because it's like out there and it's cold right now or something so i'm gonna just do this other crazy way of chopping it or whatever use the right ways and the right tools <laughs> for it and don't be it lazy about smarter. it but also have enough of them accessible that like you don't go for the not safe options or things like that so going tool wise um, I found lots of ways that you can use tools and other ways to do things, but there's a, if you have the right tools to do it, like for instance, if I need to chop something, we have a bandsaw, we have a chop saw, we have a drill press, we have all these things in our chop shop. But a lot of times when I would get lazy because the way I learned too was like, just get a cutting wheel and try that for like a way bigger thing than I need. Cutting wheel's nice for just something small you need to cut off real quick, but something like really long, I'm not gonna <laughs> get a straight line or things like that. You get lazy sometimes. So have have the things near you, but also use the things you have that are the right tools for the job and kind of learn those tools and how they're used properly. Um, so first of all, you're safe. Second of all, it goes a lot quicker and is easier for you. But um, just kind of 
setting up your workshop and all your stuff so you have the things you need and not make excuses why you're not using it or things like that. Because we have tons of tools that we do use excuses that maybe it's packed away or this, mm -hmm. and we don't always do things the easier way. But I'm warning you from the problems I come yeah. across. So once again, issues I have, like I'm, sure. I'm trying to give people good advice, right? Oh, for sure. And I mean, that's really good advice. And that brings me to another point I like to make, which is everybody, everyone is on a different um, playing field when it comes to making props or making costumes and things like that. So I've said this before, I'll say it again, do not, try not to, definitely don't if you can, compare yourself to other people in other shops. Um, there's people who are, have, who do costume contests and they have an entire shop of people like we have all working on the same costume, right? Is that the same, is that fair compared to the other things? Maybe, maybe not. Um, it depends on the rules of the costume contest, but not even that, just actually comparing. A lot of people will, will come to me and they're, they're sitting there saying like, hey, I want to make a prop like you do. And I'm like, well, I did that with a laser cutter and I, a lot of experience using the laser cutter. And they're like, oh, well, I have, I can, I can do that with a Dremel. I, I can't do that with my Dremel. I'm like, I can't do that with a Dremel either. <laughs> there's, no, I, there's no way I'm doing that with Dremel. Like some people can, I can't, right? So but I have the right tool for the right job and... I happen to be blessed enough that I have that laser cutter at the moment, um, which is, I guess, gets me to another point, which is there's no, like, there's there's a reason that people will purchase things from us, and it's not because they can't make it themselves sometimes. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it's the fact that we have the right tools shut, like, set up, right? We have the safety equipment in, in place. For you to go through and build something, a lot of times the old joke is, like, well, I could pay somebody to make it or I could spend... Like three times is the time and four times the amount of money to make it myself, right? And if you don't want to make it yourself, that's fine. That's why we're here. But it, this, the reason we're talking about this now is if you do have questions or want to know about how to make things yourself, and hopefully, like, we, we've just given you a little bit more insight into how that goes mm -hmm. um, and some of the things we're capable of and, and not just us are capable of, but people in general in the world are capable of with, with costume prop making, um, things like that and we there's definitely things that other people do they 3d print out of metal and a bunch of the stuff that we don't do at all right so mm -hmm. we we don't have by any yeah. means the best shop or the crazy giant cnc machines or something there taking care of a bunch of metal things but uh for what we do have it's it's good to to know how to use it and, and i think we summed up a lot of the tools you can use in the materials part we went pretty long in the materials part and we were like you can use this on this tool or this yeah, so yeah. like we don't and how to fabricate things with those items um so we'll go we'll probably like round not round this up but, but like because yeah. you can use belt sanders and all sorts of stuff mm -hmm. for foam to make things smooth they're all, all different types of tools right um but it also depends what materials you're kind of using mm -hmm. so we're, i think we should probably go on to the last one just to, yeah yeah let's to, to unless you up. unless you needed something else in that second i'm sorry no no to wrap I'm just up trying to keep us on we said this at the beginning i'll say it now one, thanks for getting this far in the video. But two, um, put right in the comments some of your questions, right? Come see us on Twitch and ask live what, what's happening um, and how, how things are going. Or And literally we use that kind of as our office hours. Um, if you have a question on how to do something, feel free to message us. But really, um, with the, the things that we hear in the comments and the questions we get all the time, we'll try to make videos or specifically panels where we all can agree or disagree or do things differently and might not just be with the three of us. It might be with other people. And I mean, there's a lot of panels that we have planned. Um, I want to do like just, just the business of, right? Like how, like the business part of prop making or that sort of thing or cosplaying and um, all sorts of different things. And we can go into, I mean, we had on here that we could do finishing. We, I don't think we talked about finishing hardly at all. A little bit with tools, a little bit with materials, but we can do finishing. We can do, a bunch of different things mm -hmm. um, but we want to know what you want to know about right like that's that's helpful hit us with a, with a subscribe or a follow that'd be awesome and then you'll be able to see the other stuff we come out with um, otherwise like really like, I mean so we can hit yeah. finishing do we want to give one thing sure. that we have about finishing just we'll each do one tip I'm happy to do something about finishing okay, okay so yeah. I'm gonna talk about the fight versus what I like to call crackle the crackle this isn't the same as the Lego movie Crackle, but it's different. Um, what it is is when you're when you're painting with spray paint. A lot of times, you'll have 
you know, you'll lay down your, your paint and maybe even at the very end, which is always what makes me upset and sad, which is I go to put my clear coat on something and then I'll hit it with clear coat and I'll, it'll start crackling. So there's a couple different reasons that the crackle happens. Um, if you have spray painted it, especially outside, especially during the cold, it tends to happen more. Um, uh, you'll, you know what I'm talking about. But to avoid it, the, the biggest tips are to pay attention to the back of your label on your, on your um, spray cans. There's a recoat time. Make sure that you're following within the recoat time. It's either before or after. Um, sand your props beforehand or whatever it is. A lot of times I, what, it, what it actually is is the base level coat isn't actually stuck to whatever your main prop is, the base of it is, very well. It's on there. What happens is when you hit it with the clear coat or you hit it with something else, that will chemically react and then that will like kind of contract. And when it contracts, it comes up and crackles. But when you do get crackle, you can wipe it off immediately with a rag or something like that. Um, a lot of times you can save the prop as far as like not having to resand the whole thing all the time. You can get crackle and just like wipe it off with a rag or like we've talked about before we use a lot of like baby wipes things like that if you can see it if you and, and also test it right so if you're not sure if it's gonna happen maybe hit like a part sit there for a second and make sure it's good and then then hit the whole thing and then the final way of getting around it that i found is when you're hitting especially with clear coat hit a very very light coat of clear coat like super light coat and then once you hit that and that dries do a little bit lighter coat and then you can hit a pretty heavy heavy coat and a lot of stuff, you want to get it really shiny. You're talking lots of layers of clear coat. Got a shiny, really shiny helmet. You're going to do lots and lots of layers, but you don't want to do that at, at the start. So just a nice light coat at the beginning. And that's my like fight versus crackle. And it's always continuing. Yeah. All right. Um, my, my thing with finishing is uh, wet sanding. Mm. Um, a very, very awesome thing that we started doing. Uh, a few years ago that I wasn't aware of until much later because I thought they, they were kind of exclusive things um, was wet sanding um, like 3D printed stuff and just in general wet sanding is very very useful you're able to remove very fine amounts of like either like filler primer or like wood or like whatever it is probably not wood wood doesn't do well with water um, but what it does is instead of just coating everything in dust and like you not being able to see what you're really like removing or like what what you're working on it's able to um, condense that down and that lets you actually sand through that and it doesn't clog up the sandpaper that you're using i've removed a lot of material really quickly with even higher with, with lower grit sandpaper making sure that the piece was was uh, was soaked just because it wasn't sticking into the sandpaper as much um, it's a really good uh, thing to do. Honestly, you don't need like a huge chem like a, like a chemical sink to like do it. You honestly can just get like a spray bottle, just spray down the prop, sand down for a little bit, spray down a little bit more, keep going, and just constantly doing that. And as long as you have like even uh, a work table that is like sealed, you can wipe up and clean up after. That's all you really need, especially for prop building. Um, if you were, which was why I didn't think about it before, because usually it was for like cars and stuff, and you needed like a hose set up and like a huge like like situation for that. But if you just need like a spray bottle or like I think we use something equivocable to like a, a condiment bottle, yeah, like a ketchup What's bottle, that animal and feeder looking yeah, thing. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like able to just like put a lot like put a controlled amount of water on the piece, and that you can then sand it down. Yeah, and you're. Last thing about that is your sandpaper will tell you whether it like, breaks down with, with water or not. A lot of them say water resistant. That's what you're looking for. Yeah. Uh, most sandpapers are that way. but some, Yeah, some a, lot, a lot of those higher grit ones too because it's like the finishing coat. So it would be a way higher grit mm -hmm. sandpaper that's usually a wet sand. Um, so going along with that because I explained a lot about how I like fill with epoxy sculpt and things like that. And then whether it's Bondo or other things when I'm sanding down and assembling small parts to make something large or whatever these are something we found as a tip online this past year and they were using them to actually get rid of all the lines yeah, yeah. um like all the lines on 3d prints because they have lines and like literally scraping them and scraping them and scraping their like card scrapers um so they're just like metal pieces they're using woodworking. Yeah. so people use them as woodworking when they're like trying to like 
remove burrs and things. Yeah, remove stuff, right? So they come in all different shapes and sizes you can get. I like certain ones like uh, this one that has more pointed edges and rounded edges because I can get like small little spots sometimes. Um, but you need to sharpen them every once in a while. Um, there's one side that'll be a little sharper than the other. That's the side you're kind of scraping with. Um, I pers There's different techniques on how to scrape, but I personally have found my own techniques that I like to use as well. Um, I don't use them to kind of get do all the sanding on a prop. I a lot of times will do just parts that are like sticking up that I want to get rid of or really rough parts a lot of times. Or when I said like I epoxy sculpt things, I use this all the time for those seams and those lines where I put the epoxy sculpt to really just chip off and get all of it off and then really just slide it down and smooth over those lines and it makes a nice smooth line and then I can hit it with a high grit sandpaper and it like makes it really nice and smooth and almost eliminates those lines where parts are connected together or whatever. So there's lots of different uses for these but you can definitely like scrape different plastics and other things. We've even used them when we have different like imprinted things on like an airsoft thing or something that we don't want it like saying an old logo or something like that, we can easily just scrape those off with enough pressure and stuff that they come off a lot nicer than when we were Dremel and there'd be little dents in them and things like mm -hmm. that. It gives you a lot more smoother finish because it's just taking layers of plastic off a lot of times. But yeah. uh, as I said, it's used for wood tubes because it's taking layers of wood off, like kind of shaving wood down in that sense. So there's all different sizes. We even have like really tiny ones, which don't really work for Seth too much because he's got giant hands or yeah. me as well. But they have even like this tiny yeah. that you, when you get really intricate with like little models and things like that, you could definitely use little ones. But we have a bunch of these all over the place that we, I at least use a lot. Um, and it really smooths things out. Also going along with that, just one more tip we got from someone because we're always looking for new tips oh, too yeah, is for sure. what our guy that actually makes our models sent James something that I use all the time <laughs> and it isn't even a tool that is sold he took a stirrer from an alcohol stirrer and he sharpened it to a point so it's like a rod like a metal rod that you can use to get in with a sharp point into like different lines to clean them out on prints and things but then the other end because it's a stirrer is a round metal ball on it or whatever a stainless steel ball mm -hmm. not metal stainless steel ball right well same yeah but stainless steel ball because it, it'll like clear up and you can wipe it off really easily whatever you're doing but i like use that to round off edges or like like smooth things out like, like you can literally rub it really hard into like um 3d prints and it'll smooth the things over and you can like smooth whole areas with it and so on and you can even take the whole stainless steel bar and on a big flat piece use the whole long bar to like rub and it'll really smooth things out so smoothing things out and scraping things off for finishing those are actually really helpful tips and things that have saved me a lot of time and actually made my life a lot easier. So, yeah. yeah. I'll let you wrap yeah. everything up then, I guess, right? Yeah, no, sure. So, again, uh, we got who over here? John Quaid. John Quaid. It's John Quaid. And then we got Seth Knight to my right. Um, did that rhyme? Yeah, yes, it that, did. That, that, that Shit. Into it. We're, We're switching the setup. We're switching the setup. He always has to be on my right now because he just rhymes and it's better that way. All right. Uh, I'd, I'd like to say you're my right hand man. Or right hand knight. No, okay, this is awful. Um, anyway, thank you so much for, for watching. Um, again, I'm James Wolfgar. Wolfgar Weapons and Props. That's who we are. Um, it. It's been a pleasure to, to do this, and we learned a lot of this same stuff that we talked about, like Quaid was just saying, from a lot of the other people in the community, right? We're all, for the most part, self-taught, and hopefully this has helped and will, like, help you learn your things. Uh, if you have any questions, again, hit us up on Twitch, hit us up in the comments below. We'd love to make more, uh, more videos like this, and we'll address the things that you're coming up with, your questions. Um, with that, don't forget to, you know, click the follow, subscribe, do a follow. I think that's what the kids are saying these days. I am a dad, so I have no idea. But you should do that. That'd be that'd be cool. Um, but anyway, thanks a lot. Don't let this flop. See you guys. That's what the kids that say. What the kids I don't know. Say? I, I don't know. Nope, that's what, like, No, they people, dab. The kids dab, right? I think the kids don't dab anymore. I don't think nobody But nobody we should dab that. anyway. It, it, that it's works, the right? corona dab. Did I do it right? <laughs> Sorry. Is this on? Is Bye. Still kind of on. <laughs>
she, she got off a long time ago. She got off like halfway through this. This is the bloopers, right? Yeah, we, I don't we, know. We need a blooper section, right? <laughs> if, it, if it's still on, then um, yeah. Oh yeah, it is. I'm the awesome. I'm the I'm the snap board. Yeah, you're the snap board. Snap board. It's like, why does it say take forty six? But like, I don't understand. Just have tattoos. That's what you're a cheerleader. That's a really good snap board. Got the alligator goes. Alligator goes. Who wants to get food? I feel like food is in order. We should get back. Should we get shawarma? I don't know. Shawarma. Let's go. I was trying to do an Avengers thing. She's still recording. Yeah. We all just sit around. Man, that prop building panel. Shawarma. Yeah, there's a nice swarm of blades down the, <laughs> down the road. Yeah, totally. That's been the big battle.